thank you, and Lisa Beck and Nick Anderson and everyone for the for your support and the hard work and the preparation of this lecture series that we're extremely grateful to the Architectural League and the sponsors for creating and maintaining programs like Emerging Voices. And Lisa and I are particularly honored and thrilled to receive this recognition. The opportunity to speak to all of you tonight about our thoughts and our work is a really special occasion for us. I think that represents an attempt through architecture and the sort of surrounding development of land to protect and excuse me, protect and repair. This next project that I want to show is very quick. It was essentially a temporary construction bridge formed um, from blue laminated planks that were turned, basically arches that were turned on their sides and laid onto buttresses. We made the bridge about three times as long as it needed to span the, uh, the uh, creek because the adjacent riparian wetlands was much broader. And in order to get this through a wetlands, Inland Wetlands Commission, a local conservation commission, we decided to overshoot and make the thing span much farther with much fewer impacts on the site. And we we're also trying to leverage the, the blue laminator process. Um, the, blue laminator that we use, the fabricator that we use, um, basically produce a panel that was about five feet wide, and so we used two panels um, to create the bridge deck. And the bridge deck is basically, as you, you saw, just large planks that were laid over buttresses that were formed outside of the wetland. And it follows the curvature of what was an old wood access road, and it became the construction uh, road, actually, to the tennis house. And we used the shape of the bridge to form these wheel curves. And so the prefabricated panels that were dropped into space became actually a jig on which these stroves were placed and the railings were laid onto it and then anchored into the landscape. That bridge is still there. We won this <coughs> award. We were just so excited about it. Um, and so the client was also really excited about it. It's staying there now as a permanent fixture. We use that same sort of methodology to produce another little bridge, um, which is essentially done slightly differently. It's in a nature conservancy site, a very steep wooded hillside, very delicate, it's hard to see in this picture, but very delicate uh, flora uh, along the banks that would have been really endangered by construction traffic. So in order to get it through, again, the Inland Wetlands Commission to be able to connect these two pieces of land near a nature conservancy site, we uh, concocted this idea of creating these pieces that could be shipped in uh, by a single truck and then basically craned into site from about 60 feet above the site, assembled on some temporary staging, which was then removed. And that happened in about a day, the delivery. Um, and it was the most stressful day of my life. I had a worse headache after that. Um, but I think it captures the kind of lightness um, with which the, the, the bridge touches the embankments and frees up that floodplain uh, to, to be a, a wildlife corridor and, and, and you know, easy flow uh, uh, during floods. We weren't allowed to put um, any abutments in the site, so we used the, uh, we used the existing granite ledge and surveyed it for its low bearing capacity and then placed these columns as it span. And took up this last project, which I'd like to show you um, and end with. Uh, it's our own little sort of infrastructure project. It's not parking cars, it's parking materials. Um, it's a shed for a landscape contractor um, who was getting pressure from, again, a local Inlands Wetlands Commission to try to tidy up his site. He needed a storage building for the material and for his uh, the equipment. And so we treated this as a kind of packing problem. Um, uh, basically organizing these just sort of spread out to shell of pallets back into really clear maneuverable pallets and then stacking it on a simple metal frame um, and letting the sort of the material become the expression of the building. Um, it's funny how projects, once you get a really good idea going, and this was a really collaborative idea with the client, 
you, you kind, of, kind of get obsessed with it. And so this represents everyone's sort of collective obsessive compulsive. Um, but it became a kind of real pleasure to organize it on such a simple basis. And um, I'll just run through this rather quickly. The loader uh, sizes all of the pallets and sizes, makes the size of the building and generates the reach of the boom. It uh, generates the space within the return radius underneath the canopy. It re uh, uh, generates the space within. The building is um, clad on the interior of that sort of material with just polygal or polycarbonate sheet. It's pretty inexpensive. There's skylights above a uh, space frame truss, pre prefab uh, commercial space frame um, that actually hold translucent photovoltaic panels. The costs of getting power to the site were pretty expensive. The payback at the time when fuel costs were skyrocketing, it's now back to something we're familiar with, um, started to make the life cycle costs of providing photovoltaic cells on the roof something uh, uh, actually economically um, probably says more about us than about the project a friend of mine described this as a love affair between a tractor and its shed. <laughs> <laughs> the quality of light that falls through those um, transistor panels is, is pretty wonderful. It's very dappled. Um, and of course, all the heat energy is taken out of it because it's absorbed primarily by the center of the photovoltaic surface. Um, but the light coming through the sidewalls when the material shifts around is, is particularly satisfying. I have to say, it's kind of like when we tore the boards off the old boarding up windows in our building when we renovated it for our studio and discovered kind of different qualities of light that occur. This guy gets to have that on a regular basis. He moves his materials around. We start to use, again, really simple um, available systems and materials, plank flooring. You know, residential form concrete. I'm going to end here. I feel like I've rushed. I didn't want to step on dinner because it's kind of an incredible presentation. But I just want to say something about uh, this idea of managing resources. It's funny to be thinking about this work in a sort of uh, broad way, again, to see all the changes that we've gone through, Lisa and I discuss that with the president office a lot. It's particularly funny to be thinking of us as emerging. Jonathan referred to this at this particular time, this economy. I think we've experienced the difficulties of excess and luxury, and also the real rewards of excess and luxury. I see that almost profession-wide. I mean, to think that some of the worst excesses of architecture may have been committed, but some of the most interesting research was allowed to happen. And I wonder what's going to happen now in a sort of new era, a new, with a new paradigm, just maybe something like scarcity. And I hope that some projects can still be experimental, maybe at a smaller scale, maybe with more detail. Um, they can think larger thoughts, but maybe they act more locally to be, uh, to be as a commonplace. I mean, it's a funny time. We don't have much measure. We know about sustainability, but you know, we're, we're, we're not really clear what that means or how to measure how sustainable we are. Um, you know, I, I thought of a couple of examples of what was going on. I mean, our experience at Fairfield was that LEAD, which is a really admirable program, offers more credits for steel, in some cases because it's, it's recycled content, than wood um, as a fast renewable resource. Um, because of the recycled content of steel, even though wood requires about a quarter to half the 
BTUs per square foot of construction that steel does. The Journal of Industrial Ecology, a joint study was just published from the uh, University of Ohio, Ohio State University and the University of Illinois, um, which discussed the sort of high performance aspects of nanomaterials. And what they learned was because of the incredibly high tolerances in the manufacturing process and because of uh, high levels of waste due to those high tolerances, that many nanomaterials had enormous environmental footprints and, in fact, sometimes some of them were hundreds of a hundred times greater than some conventional materials. And so I think our, our thoughts about how we actually solve environmental problems is starting to be skewed and the metrics are really unclear. I mean, even on a day-to-day -day basis, someone suggested, I think a, a known researcher and scientist suggested it was very possible that the fuel consumed in the production and transport of milk, the amount of milk it would require you to to the number of calories provided by the milk that would allow you to walk two miles was more than that that would cost you to use driving your SUV two miles. And so there are all these sort of very deeply embedded costs that we don't fully understand. And I want to find the way in our work that we can, to the best of our abilities, understand the issues of constraints and the sort of uh, basic message that design is the sum of all constraints, as Charles Dean said. And so these are just little studies for us. They're not really sustainable buildings. Buildings aren't sustainable. They're incredibly material intensive. They take a lot of energy to produce. But I think we can work to scale back the impacts. And that's what we want to do. And that's what we're searching for. Um, and this isn't the answer. It's, it's really just the kind of practice for us.